This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the multi-talented Bruce Kimmel. He started out as an actor, you know, he guest starred on the Doris Day Show, MASH, The Partridge Family, he was on there a lot. And um, he was also on The Bob Crane Show and Liver and Shirley. And then he worked his way up to writing, producing, directing. He made the first nudie musical. I mean, that's the name of the movie. And um, it's celebrating its 45th anniversary this year. And it's a really funny, underrated movie. I wanted to chronicle it. He also made The Creature Wasn't Nice, a.k.a. Spaceship, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. One of Leslie Nielsen's earliest comedies. Um, I think he did it right after Airplane. And it's going to be a great talk today. I cannot wait. And November, it's off to a good but slow start. You know, I had a um, powerhouse interview yesterday that ended up being rescheduled. I was really bummed yesterday, but I will get by and hopefully it'll happen in the future. In the meantime, I've got amazing people to talk to that are already pre, pre-scheduled. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Bruce Kimmel. Hello. Hey, Bruce. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am spectacular. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. So, going back in time, did you... Gra- Uh-oh. Did you, <laughs> did you gravitate toward acting and showbiz early on in your childhood? Well, yeah, uh, not actively, except yes, is the answer to that question, when I was probably four. <laughs> when you were four? My dream was always to be an actor. Yeah, did your parents take you to the movies and the theater, and that's what sparked the interest there? Not to the theater that early, but movies from as far back as I can remember, either on television or in the movie theaters. And I used to, you know, in the days I was growing up, I started going to the movie theaters alone when I was five or six. Wow. Back when you could actually do that. You can't yeah. Not, nowadays. And we had three within a mile of my house. So I saw everything. <laughs> <laughs> And then as, at an early age, I started going, taking buses to um, bigger theaters in Westwood and Hollywood, and it's, that was my life. I used to get up and dream, or not dream when I was up, but think I was on being filmed by a VistaVision camera, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I made a camera out of my father's uh, cardboard and his shirts, and I would just go on do live location things with holding my cardboard camera. I was a very strange child. <laughs> That's okay, we all were. Did you have a tendency to gravitate toward the comedies and the musicals? No. Uh, interestingly, I mean, I loved them, and I, I loved musicals, and I loved comedy, of course, but I, I loved uh, movies like The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and The Time Machine and Sci-Fi. Village of the, Village of the Damned and... Uh, I love fantasy and uh, sci-fi, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. And I loved Hitchcock. I, from very early on, I saw Rear Window in a movie theater and To Catch a Thief and uh, then The Man Who Knew Too Much was a big and big thing in my life and um, everything. I saw every Hitchcock movie when it came out. Wow. Did you did you watch the uh, horror hosts like Vampyra and Sister Seymour? It wasn't Vampyra. I, you know, I remember Vampyra from, yeah. on TV in the 50s. I didn't watch it. The one I loved was Zachary, and I don't think I watched him, but I, he was in Famous Monsters of Filmland. Mm-hmm. I always thought we should have Zachary, and then I met him and worked with him, so that was fun. But uh, I can't remember if we had a horror host here, or, you know, until uh, other than the original Vampyra, but... Did yeah. we? Did we in California? I can't remember. <laughs> I know Elvira <laughs> came along at some point. But. Oh, yeah. 
I just did a tribute to Vampira talking to her niece who has a book out about her. She's uh, had a nice waist. Yeah. <laughs> I recall, like, no waist. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so did you do uh, school plays and community theater? I did. Uh, when I got to the first thing I ever... No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I started doing school shows in high school because mm-hmm. uh, there was no program in, in junior high. Um, I, I went to summer camp in 1961 and I did something there, I recall. And that was probably the first time I ever did anything on a stage of, of sorts. I did the Pied Piper of Hamlin and I was the Pied Piper. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, but as soon as 1962 hit, I started doing plays in high school. What about uh, when you got to college? College, it was that was my major. So every minute of every day, I was doing scenes or plays. Or and we did a lot of stuff at college. I went with a lot of great people to Los Angeles City College, which was in those days the place you wanted to go. It was the most well thought of drama department anywhere. And, uh, you know, had turned out people like James Coburn and Robert Vaughn and mm-hmm. uh, Morgan Freeman and Clint Eastwood and all kinds of Alexis Smith, Donna Reed. And so, uh, and our class was extraordinary. So it was really a wonderful, wonderful school. I did a lot of great shows there. Yeah. Who, who were some of your classmates that went on to become successful? Well, Cindy Williams. Yeah. But uh, a guy named Bill Ewing was in my class, and he went on to become a, a really big uh, film producer, uh, executive at Columbia. Oh, God. There was a lot of working actors came out of the class. And then a little later, uh, Mike Lembeck, who became an actor and then a yeah. director, and his father was Harvey. And uh, we, he was my best friend back then. And uh, Annette Cardona. Uh, who was in the movie of Greece as Cha Cha and did a lot of stage and film. Yeah. And uh, just a lot of people came out of there. And then eventually, in the you know, I, I came back a lot to do shows mm-hmm. as an alumni, uh, direct them. And uh, in the early 70s, there was Diana Canova. You know, I got a lot of people for my film from there. And uh, Mark Hamill went there. Wow. That's amazing. So let's get into acting credits. You guest starred on the Doris Day show. Well, not really. The it, that was an interesting thing because we had mm-hmm. no idea at the time it was going to happen. But that was the first. Uh, it was a pilot called Young Love, um, which was the first pilot I ever did for CBS, and it was produced by her company, uh, Arwen Productions. And that was I got that in January of '71. It's my second job professionally um, on film and uh, only later did they tell us it was also going to be an episode on her show (laughs) so it was a backdoor I guess they call that a backdoor pilot but they aired the pilot version yeah CBS and then they aired it on her show and both versions I you know it's amazing how these things live on are on the DVD of her show Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, both versions, Young Love and... <laughs> and that was an extraordinary cast. My God, I think back on that. And there was uh, Michael Burns, and uh, who was a very popular young actor. And it was Meredith Baxter's first job. Right. And uh, Brenda Sykes was in it. We had a really fun company. And the director was a really well-known Disney director named Norman Tokar, who became a oh, yeah. friend. Was it a good experience? I ended up in a Norman Tokar Disney film because he just wanted me around. So. <laughs> Was it a good experience working with Doris? Uh, we only met her once. We The only scenes uh, that were added for the one that aired on her show were with Meredith. Oh, okay. So we only, she came down to the set once. It was like, yes, because she was in The Man Who Knew Too Much. My God, I wanted her to be my mother. <laughs> That you were on one of the earliest episodes of MASH. Yeah, I think that was season one. I think it was the end of season one. 
Right. Uh, and that was a very uh, weird day for me because I had to be somewhere. At, at, they assured me I'd be out in time to do. I had written a musical that was at the American College Theater Festival, and I had to go be there in Long Beach. And they, of course, ran late, and I was late to getting there. But it, they were so friendly. That was one of the friend. That's when I, I, I was lucky and worked on a lot of friendly sets. But that one, you know, they welcomed you. I remember Loretta Swit came right out, welcome to MASH. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alan Aldo was hugely friendly. They all were really friendly. Well, I really liked that set. But I never met. This is interesting. I think the director of that episode, I can't remember, but maybe it was E.W. Swackhammer, somebody like one of those TV guy regulars. Yeah. And I never met him. I never saw him. He never (laughs) said two words to me. If he was there, I had not. I'm so sure he was there. But isn't that funny that you would never say even hello to a director? Yeah, that is pretty strange. And the show hadn't even taken off yet, right? I don't know if it was a hit right away. I guess, I think it was a uh, did okay right away, but it was this. This was the. I know it was the end of the of season one, yeah. like the, the one of the last two, two or three episodes. And then, um, how did you get cast on the Partridge Family? That was soon after the pilot, the the Doris Day thing. Mm-hmm. Um, probably within two months after that. And I went in, the, my agent called me and said, you have an appointment? I didn't know what the show was even. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd ever heard of it, so I watched it and I thought it was really charming. And um, I, it was me and four other actors read for it, one of whom was named Kimmel, Joel Kimmel at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, one of those, you know, readings, you know, you can always sort of take the temperature of the room when you walk in the audition room. Yeah. And they were so nice and welcome, again, very welcoming. And you do well when it's that kind of room. And I just, it was a really funny scene. This is one scene. And uh, I knew the second I finished, I had it. It was just one of those. That doesn't happen really often, I don't think. But yeah. I walked out of there knowing I had it. And I looked at the other boys and I said, come again another day. And uh, two hours later, I had it. You played... um, That started a long journey with them. (laughs) You played many different characters on there, Freddie, Marvin, Howard, but Richard Whipple you played twice. Yeah, who knew? Uh, (laughs) They liked me. That's all I can tell you. They liked having me around. They thought I was good. You know, I knew my lines, I hit my marks, and I got along with everybody really well, especially the cast. And uh, they just kept calling. It was so, whenever they had something that was right for me, they would call. It didn't, and you couldn't do that today, I don't think, play different characters. You no. Know, one season. No, because with Mar- the... Marvin and Freddie were the same season. Richard, the two, two Richards were in, I think that was the same season. And then the final guy, but it was really wonderful doing those. Yeah, did you ever work with Martin Spear on it? Martin Spear does not sound familiar. Okay, he played the engineer on the show. He was in that horror movie, The Hills Have Eyes. I met him one time, and he was surprised that I remembered him on The Partridge Family, too. He was just shocked. He thought he was forgotten from that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember him. No, I don't remember I don't think he was in my episodes. Was it a fun set, though? It was the funnest The funnest set. Ever. Yeah. Because they were just like family to me. I mean, they really were like family. I was very, you know, ultimately I got very close to David and Susan and um, and Shirley loved me. And and the kids liked me, you know, Danny and, and still liked me. Oh, that's great. You still got to uh, keep in touch with them then. Well, we, you know, this past year, the crazy last year, mm-hmm. I, they found me. These Partridge fans who are incredible found me on Facebook. And, and so I started getting involved. They started involving me in these podcasts. Mm-hmm. So they had a, like a reunion podcast, this guy, Johnny Ray Miller, who's written a book about 
the Partridge Family Music, mm-hmm. uh, hosted like a reunion podcast, and Shirley was there, and I was there, and Danny and Brian, uh, I think that was it, and uh, that was really fun. And Henry Diltz was there, who was David's, you know, the photographer, uh, and he and I had on the episode on the boat when we got to cruise um, uh, the, the last episode I did he was on the, the boat and we really did and had fun and he read from his diary back then and apparently we had breakfast together mm-hmm. I have a memory of it but <laughs> uh, if, that, if that's on YouTube I'm going to check it out that sounded like it was a lot of fun that episode was incredible for me I mean to go you know I got to cruise first class up to Acapulco, and then we shot on the way back, and it was amazingly fun. And, and the poor people who had paid to have a nice cruise without you know, interruption <clears throat> had mm-hmm. to sit and watch us film. Uh, and there were two actors on the boat, and I felt so bad for them. <laughs> they take a cruise to get away from Hollywood, and there we all are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you who they were. It was John Lupton, mm-hmm. who was in a show when I was a kid called Sheriff of Cochise on TV that I loved, mm-hmm. and I told him so. And uh, James Franciscus. Oh. <laughs> from the Escape, for one, one of those Planet movies of the apes. Yeah. And But he used to do a, sh- a TV show called Mr. Novak that they shot at my high school. Right. Wow. So it's funny how these things all... <laughs> Are, but that was a great, fun episode in many, many ways. And then um, you're on the Bob Crane show. Did you get to work with him? I did. I did. You know, it says I did two of them on the IMDb, but I don't think that's right. I would remember. Maybe I, I don't remember. I don't remember much about that show. I remember an actor called James... Sutorius, I think his name was, who mm-hmm. I was a terrific actor. And Bob was very, very nice. And uh, I think the director was famous. I think it was Jay Sandridge. Um, and it was fun. It was We had fun doing it. I just don't, I don't remember. There's certain shows you remember vividly. Right. And then certain shows, you go, what, what did I do on that show? And one of those was the Super, which is very short-lived, uh, show that Rob Reiner and Phil Mishkin created, and it was starred uh, Richard Castellano mm-hmm. and his daughter. <laughs> and I know I did play the date for his daughter. That's all I, I ascertained that by reading a synopsis. But I have no memory other than I met a lot of great people. You know, uh, Bruno Kirby was in that. And, mm-hmm. um, um, a wonderful character actor named Ed Peck, and I met Vic Tabak on that set, and so we all became. I worked with both of those gentlemen a lot, so that was fun. We're, we're, what a terrible show! Terrible show! Yeah. And Richard Castellano, I don't speak ill of the dead, but he was a vile person on that show. I can imagine. <laughs> I'm sure he was nice on other shows, but he was so full of himself, and I just remember the read through. Mm-hmm. I remember the read through was in the Playboy building on Sunset Boulevard. Isn't that funny? Where yeah. I would end up working later. But uh, the uh, I remember walking into the office and to the read through, and he came in, you know, like he was Cary Grant or something, you know, like a huge star. Yeah. And threw the script on the floor and stomped it with his foot. He said, this is shit. <laughs> and poor Rob and Phil were there going, oh my God. <laughs> were, were you a bank teller in the Apple Dumpling Gang? I was. That was the Norman Tokar film. He just called okay. me out of the blue and said, do you want to come do this? And it was a very small bit in the script. But he just kept adding me in scenes. So that was, it, it was supposed to be one day and it ended up being a week. Mm-hmm. So, so I was a week, you know, having lunch with Tim Conway and Don Knotts and John McIver, all these people I loved. Bill Bixby. <laughs> Bill. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know that he was in any of my scenes, but I met him. And uh, I was mostly with uh, Conway and Knotts and, and McIver. But I just, it was so much fun. And 
to be on the back lot on the Western Disney Street was incredible. Yeah. Oh my God. That's one of my favorite Disney movies of all time. But just not people in Conway. People love that movie, especially if you, people who grew up back then. But um, I remember I went to the theater to see it uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. In fact, the same theater that the first movie musical would end up playing on Hollywood Boulevard. <clears throat> and uh, was I, I think I was um, annoyed that I was not credited. Mm-hmm. Which is which is why you don't do favors. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of bizarre, huh? Not to be credited like that. Yeah, it was weird to me, uh, but uh, you know, because I mean, I'm there. I'm clearly on screen, and I had just finished shooting the musical, so I thought, well, yeah, they should have billed me for this. But you have to have it in your contract, and you don't do fa- you, you do favors, but you got to get your you know people involved. Yeah. So what's the genesis of the first nudie musical? The genesis, uh, (laughs) for those who aren't bored by the story, uh, was in 1969, I lived in New York for a year. Mm -hmm. Went there to be an actor, a famous actor, and could not get a job. I got one job the entire year I was there as an actor, Mm -hmm. doing summer stock. And then... So in order to, my, my then wife was pregnant at the time, which was a surprise to both of us. And uh, I remember having to go to work at a place that took surveys, surveys, you know, phone surveys, you would call people all over the country, right. take a survey. And it was called com, uh, Commercial Analysts, I think it was the name. A lot of actors worked there, a lot of actors you would know probably. And that turned out to be super, super fun for me, you know, because you're just hanging around great people. And anyway, we used to, sometimes there were movies they called nudies back then. Yeah. Porno was not a thing. You know, there were stag films, but in the movie theaters, you saw nudie movies. Mm -hmm. So movies with a lot of nudity, some badly simulated sex, no male nudity, (coughs) and cheesy movies. And I started seeing those with Cindy and, and my friend Alan Abelou in L.A. Uh, we saw The Lustful Turk, I remember. <laughs> and, and I just loved the titles, and I loved how cheesy they were. So in New York, we would do little field trips to go see movies like She Came on the Bus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my favorite title. And I just loved them, so I came up with this idea that we should do a nudie musical. And I wrote, I remember writing three or four songs for it, and I still have, like, uh, somebody who worked there did a little poster for it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, (laughs) and there was a woman who worked there named Mary LeMay, and that's where I took the name Mary LaRue from. (laughs) And so I would talk about this, and when I came back to L.A., and we had our daughter here um, to live, uh, Cindy and I got together a bunch, and I told her this, and she loved this idea. She thought this was the greatest idea, and it was, by the way. <clears throat> and um, so we just kept talking about it, and she said, I, maybe I can get my friend Jack Nicholson to star in it. I said, yeah, okay, and we'll... We'll shoot it at eight millimeter, and we'll all change our names and wear mustaches. And, and just over the years, it got. I met a guy named Mark Haggard. Uh, my friend Alan mm-hmm. introduced me to Mark, and he had done some softcore stuff. By that time, pornos were in. Yeah. In the early seventies, and um, we just would just talk and talk, and he loved the idea as well. He loved. Light Parade and those kinds of musicals. And at that point, there was no script or story or anything. And um, then in 19, then, then in, I guess it was 74, we found some money or we found, you know, we would go pitch to people, mm-hmm. like really bad, sleazy people. But occasionally you would go pitch to really interesting people, like we pitched it to director George 
Sydney, if you know who that is. I've heard of him, yeah. Made Bye Bye Birdie and uh, The Swinger with Anne Margaret and Showboat at MGM. He did a lot of MGM movies. Yeah. <clears throat> Hugely popular director. And so that was interesting. We weren't, we didn't want anybody to direct it but us. But uh, <laughs> in 74, I remember we found a guy named Jack Reeves and he put together enough money to do the movie. And I know the first person we asked to star in it was Henry Winkler. Yeah. Because Henry was dating Cindy and that he, he wisely did not do it <clears throat> for him. Yeah. And then somebody I know recommended Archie Hahn and, <laughs> and Archie didn't want to do it for some reason. And he should, you know, the, he, I, and the, Lucky for us, he didn't. Uh, that I love Archie, but he was not the one. Yeah. And then we just lucked into it. I can't even remember how we met him. Uh, Stephen Nathan, who had done the original production of Godspell, he played Jesus, and uh, had been in the film version of 1776. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he came in and he was perfect. Just what you would want. In a leading man, he was funny, good looking, and so that was perfect. And so we had this money. We had $150,000, except that they lied and we only had 125. Uh, <laughs> and at the last minute, we got the other $25,000 from a guy named Joe Brooks, that name you may or may not know, Yeah. who, who was also dating Cynthia at that time. She was going through guys like, you know, <laughs> crazy. And, uh, <laughs> Joe Brooks wrote You Light Up My Life. Yeah. And became infamous for many other reasons you don't want to talk about on the radio. <laughs> and, uh... It's he, okay, uh, you can. <laughs> he, he, no, he just, he had a very, very weird end of life. Many accusations of... Oh, I can imagine. Improper things, we'll say. Um, and it di died in jail, uh, actually. But he wrote You Light Up My Life and was putting together that movie when we were shooting Duty Musical, and because he and Cindy were not getting along well, mm -hmm. he at one point said, "Would you? I can't direct her, would you direct the movie? And I said, sure, but then they broke up, so he directed them. <laughs> and, uh, but we, so we went into production um, in May, on May 5th, we started shooting of 1975, and what an experience that was, 150 grand, 35 millimeter, nine songs, huge cast, a lot of which I recruited from LACC. And, uh, yeah. Those the rest is history, but ask me any questions, I'll <laughs> tell you no lies. I think I, I think I saw C uh, Cindy do a Q&A show on um, YouTube, and she said that uh, she was doing the pilot for Laverne and Shirley and Paramount bought the first nudie musical, and she was thinking to herself, my career is over, or something like that. She, you have, you have to preface that with that she loved the movie. And yeah. still loves the movie. Hugely. Yeah. And what happened was, we had filmed the movie, and we were previewing the movie everywhere, you know, like from August on. Everywhere. <laughs> and, uh... Yeah. We had uh, done a sneak, I, I remember we had done a sneak preview, I don't know if you know what interlock is, but you take the work print and separate sound. Mm -hmm. And certain theaters in LA had, were set up to do that and everywhere around the country. So, and that was the way the, the picture didn't have main titles yet. You know, it was, it was a work print, no dissolves or, you know, opticals or anything. And uh, we previewed it at the uh, uh, Academy Theater in Pasadena, which was a huge preview house. I think that's where the Magnificent Ambersons previewed. Um, and for some reason, it was, I, me I remember the main feature was Tommy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the theater was jammed. And this is, you know, 1700 seat theater. And the reaction was unbelievable. Cindy and I were there, and my ex wife. And, all of us were there, and it was screaming laughter. I've never heard anything like it. It was like being at the producers or Blazing Saddles or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we knew we were, you know, I, 
there were a few problems we had to address. But And then I took it to New York to preview it, and we previewed it all over L.A. And <clears throat> coming back from New York, we previewed it in what, the night I got back from New York. We previewed it in Westwood uh, with Love and Death with Woody Allen's picture. And we got more laughs. Yeah, we, we, Paramount was there, and they bought it that day, the next day. Did you run across anybody who was truly offended by it? Many, many <laughs> people were offended by it. I, I think the Legion of Decency, you know, gave us their slap on the hand, and uh, a lot of people were offended that Cindy was in it, and they called her Little Miss Trash Mouth, and you know, she's <laughs> now we're not nude. I mean, there's plenty who are, but we're not, and. Uh, but in the middle of all of the previewing, she got Laverne and Shirley. Right. And none of us thought it was a, an issue, you know. And in fact, the whole scene that's the major scene in the film wasn't in the film when Paramount bought it, which is Dancing Dildos. Yeah. <laughs> and Dancing Dildos, you know, they called me into an, a meeting and they said, you know, there's these six minutes in the movie, in the middle of the movie, that don't get laughs. I said, Okay. <laughs> what, do you, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> and they said, well, we want you to take out those six minutes and replace it with another six minutes. You can do anything you want. I said, are you serious? I don't want to do that. Are you serious? They said, we're giving you $75,000 and we want it to be a musical number. And so I went home and that night thought of Dancing Dildos and wrote it and they loved it. And uh, we shot it in over two days and Cindy was already filming Laverne and Shirley and had her Laverne uh, Shirley hair, which was different from the hair in our movie, so she had to wear a hat. Uh, in the dance, that's why she's wearing a hat and dancing dildos. And um, but to have half the budget of the movie to shoot a two-day sequence, mm -hmm. that was unbelievable luxury. You know what I mean? It was unbelievable. I, I got to do every kind of setup you would want, you know? I yeah. didn't want for coverage. I didn't... It was um, it was great. I loved it. And then the problems happened, you know, later. Yeah. Bernard and Shirley became a huge hit, and they scheduled the release of our film, because they had to. They had no choice. It was contractual. And, uh, you know, they began to try to pretend we didn't exist. Dude, it was painful because I had the head of Paramount uh, call me into his office and tell me I was the next, you know, Mel uh, Brooks and Woody Allen. Yeah. That's the title of my book. There's Mel, there's Woody, and there's you. That's what he said to me. And suddenly uh, that went away. And that was very hard to deal with, really super hard to deal with. So, they, you know, they opened it all around the country. And I always thought they buried it, you know, and they the tiny little ads and stuff. Yeah. But new, newspapers.com has proved me wrong. Oh, that's good. It took really big ads and everything, and it did, it did okay. And, but it got rave reviews because they didn't show it to critics. Right. And so the critics would have to go to the theater to see it and review it. And that somehow worked in our favor. I can imagine people there's, still come up. Discovery, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I can imagine. We got raves after we had gotten two terrible reviews in the trades. I remember I was shooting a pilot, uh, and the trades came out on one of the days I was shooting at uh, Columbia, and I, <laughs> I said, "Well, I'm killing myself. I have to leave the set." <laughs> because they showed it to these two critics. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were just trying to kill us. And they showed it to the, the Hollywood Reporter and Variety at nine in the morning, just the two of them. I can imagine. I hated it. How could you not hate it at nine in the morning? Yeah. Who wants to see nudity <laughs> and comedy at nine in the morning? Not me. <clears throat> so those were our first two reviews. So when the other reviews started happening, that was great. We got major quotes. And then they were not going to open it in L.A., for obvious reason, and we threatened them to sue them because it was contractual. They had to open it, and Cindy, God bless her, wrote the strongest note to the head of Paramount and said, I will not do any publicity for Laverne and Shirley 
or the amount of publicity I'll do for Laverne and Shirley will be commensurate with the amount of publicity you give to the first Mary musical. Unbelievable note. Yeah. I mean, what chutzpah that took, and it worked. So they opened it in L.A., and we got rave reviews here. And uh, they opened it at one theater in Westwood, uh, where we did a little premiere on our own. And one theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and the grosses were really good. And after the second week, uh, what they didn't know at Paramount is I had a really good friend who was one of the big people at Man Theaters. Mm-hmm. where we were playing and he called me after two weeks and he said they're going to pull the picture that the head of distribution at Paramount called Ted Mann personally and told him to remove the picture you know it was doing really well yeah and we never went wide in LA and uh, that was horrible And but we ended up I went public with the story which I shouldn't have done because it really hurt me mm-hmm. you know Little boys don't take on the big boys, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But we got the movie back. They sold us the movie back. That's good. And we found a different distributor in New York who loved it, and uh, they turned it around and did an incredible campaign. So in 1977, that happened, and we were a smash in New York, played three months in one theater. And then it went wide, and the week it went wide, we were the fourth highest grossing film in the nation right under Star Wars, oh. <laughs> light up my life and the spy who loved me and us. Amazing. And I think Paramount was, because they would mention it in the grosses, they said, Paramount's probably upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not good for my career. But anyway, but it was a great time that time. And they played that picture, that distributor. I always thought it played that one year, you know, and then went wide and we never saw, I don't know why they didn't, bring it back to the West Coast, but they played that film for five years. Wow. I found ads all the way through 83. And, you know, so they played it with other like movies, like Groove 2, or, you know, things that would come out yeah. that were appropriate. <laughs> the uh, Techies you know, Ride movie. Playing a lot. And yeah. And amazing. And they kept it going so long. I'm sure people still come up to you to this day and say they love it. They do. They do. And it has a very loyal and large fan base. You know, I put it out on Blu-ray, uh, I guess it's eight years ago now, and uh, <clears throat> it's done really well. And I've done an adaptation for stage. And if anybody has guts, we'll do it someday, but nobody has guts yet. And, <laughs> um, so that was fun. But it's, it's, it's the, you know, it's, it's what it is, and people love it, and I think it's lasted so long because, in essence, it's a very sweet movie where you care about the three leads, and that's really important. And so you get all the outrageous stuff happens around that, and, and people just like it. I was always, you know, you worry when these crazy... PCs and woke people start happening and canceling everybody. Oh, you know, God. I don't think yeah. there's anything in the movie they could point at. Yeah. Did Sydney have any reservation about saying the stunt cock is here? <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> and Cindy says it all the time. That's her favorite line she's ever spoken anywhere. Nice. <laughs> she just... <laughs> You know, it's not something you can do. She does. A, she's been putting together and doing the one-woman show. Mm-hmm. And uh, she talks about nudity musical, but she does not. She, I, she may actually speak the line or show a clip from it, but it's hard for conservatives. Right. Even today. Uh, what, what was Alexandra Morgan like to work with? She's great, but I knew her. Um, yeah. She was part of a theater company in L.A. called the Company Theater uh, and that my friend Alan Ablu was part of and uh, so I had seen her in a lot of shows and she just came, we saw so many people for that part and she just came in and nailed it but we saw Tiffany Bowling if you remember her? Bob. Oh yeah, I remember her. She did a lot of those caged in, you know, Mexico movies, you know, what it, women in cages movies and uh, Edie, Edie Williams, mm-hmm. the Russ Meyer girl. 
Yeah. What's her name? She was the star of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, I think. Uh, she came in and read. Uh, it was a lot of lot of people you would know. Frank, uh, you had Frank Doubleday. And we didn't know Frank. He just came in and read, and I thought he was so hilarious because he was so serious. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I just thought he was great. I had no idea. I knew. I guess I knew because we knew uh, Dan O'Bannon. Mm-hmm. I guess I think we knew he had done uh, Escape from New York, but I hadn't seen it. That but, was that was in eighty one. Yeah, he was great. I love Frank Doubleday. Is he, is he still with us? <laughs> uh, he died a couple years ago. That's um, what I thought. I thought. I think I remember when he passed. They're all passing. My God, everybody's dying. And um, Whatever happened to Mark Haggard? Mark uh, is in Arizona still, as far as I know. He got he just, just hated earthquakes. And I think after 93, he moved. Um, or whenever that one in the 90s. And a, so he's in Arizona, and he's a, kind of a hermit. Yeah, you would say. <laughs> film, you know, he has this huge film collection, so he watches movies. And, uh, you know, I was talk, talking to him pretty regularly around the time we put out the Blu-ray, because when we did the DVD, we had to do it from a print, or you know, five prints actually, mm-hmm. to, to make a decent thing, and it wasn't decent enough for me but in the meantime between that and and the blu-ray we found the uh cri which was the printing negative you know the inner negative and so we were able to use that and that was in perfect shape so that was Mm -hmm. and get the color right and everything and i'm going to have that actually i was looking at it yesterday the cans and uh I think I'm going to have that scanned at 2K and just protect it. Nice. I, I um, saw Annette O'Toole did some overdubbing of that girl singing. Yes. She, you know, the, the, we had originally cast a girl named Ronnie Troop, mm-hmm. uh, who was a working actress, the daughter of Bobby Troop. Oh, yeah. Songwriter. And um, she, I just thought she was adorable and she loved the idea of it, and then she didn't. She got nervous because in the script there was nudity for that character originally. Yeah. And the scene that that was in ended up getting cut anyway, and we ended up not doing the nudity in that scene anyway because we wanted to keep the nudity only to the movie within the movie stuff. I re- I remember when you were in a couple episodes of Laverne and Shirley, the good the Good Time Girls episode. You know that is a textbook. <laughs> uh, in in comedy timing yeah and i hadn't seen it since we did it and uh it's on youtube or i may i have the dvd or something but i thought youtube uh about three years ago and i thought like look at that timing look Mm -hmm. at uh, steven and i and her and you know because i knew cindy so well it was second nature to us but it's such a funny scene that you could not do today. No. <laughs> it's crazy. God forbid you should have fun, you know. Yeah. And you were also the organ player in Take Two, they're small, where they go on the, the date with the two dwarfs. Yeah, the organ player, that was not <laughs> planned, I will say to you. And I suffered the same fate that I did when I didn't, uh, <laughs> when it was a favor. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I've not billed in that episode. <clears throat> but Cindy called me at like five in the afternoon mm-hmm. for filming day. And she said, Brucey, it, we, they hired an extra to do this organ player. And he's not funny and he doesn't know what to do. And it, we need we need to, you know, have you, can you come in right now? Mm-hmm. He said, are you insane? But I did. I drove over to Paramount, was there 15 minutes later, 10 minutes later, and they just put me in the scene. Mm-hmm. You know, they had done the writer's rehearsal just before the first of the two performances. I think they filmed it twice. I can't remember for sure. But I think there were two audiences. But So they just threw me in there, and they said, just, you know, do your you know expressions and everything, but don't say anything. 
<laughs> but we did that, and we shot it twice, and it was, you know, it was fun. And then after that, they came in uh, after the audience had left and did those the close-ups with the dialogue, mm-hmm. which I just made up. And that was really fun. And because they didn't bill me, they gave me the immediately thereafter the episode with their army hygiene films. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that was my gift <laughs> for no billing. But it was that was turned out to be a great episode. What's the genesis of spaceship? Well, um, I love sci fi. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be funny to do a musical version of Alien, which Mark Haggard had been involved with. In fact, Alien would not exist uh, had Mark Haggard not gotten it to 20th Century Fox and his friends there. Um, and he got a piece of the movie for it that he's lived his entire life on. Mm-hmm. And uh, he thought that was a funny idea. So, you know, because I, I grew up loving the thing and uh, it came from outer space and all those movies. I especially love the Monster Loose on the Spaceship movies. And uh, that was the genesis, and I wrote it in 1980, in the summer of 1980, in Cindy's office. They gave her an office on the Zoetrope lot, near Francis Coppola's lot, mm-hmm. which used to be General Studios, I think. And... Uh, I spent the summer there watching them get ready to film One from the Heart and looking at those sets and seeing people like Michael Powell, you know, and Nastasha Kinski walking around the lot. It was an incredible time. Gene Kelly, just stare out the window and see these people. So I wrote it. And then the distributor who had picked up Nudie Musical, I called him and I said, I've got this thing. What do you think? Want to make it? He said, sounds great. Can, 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 can you get Cindy signed for it? Because I said it was written for Cindy and me. And I said, I think so. And so we, I went back to Cindy and I said, they need you to actually sign the contract. And that became such an ordeal because her agents were very tough. And that took four months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to figure out her deal, because it had to be favored nations. Everybody had to get the same money. Mm -hmm. And uh, on my birthday in 1980, uh, she handed me the contract. (laughs) So I knew we were to go, and that was also coincidentally the day John Lennon was killed. Um, So, (laughs) interesting day. Um, Night. And... um, so we, we had the deal. They couldn't get out of it. <laughs> I had the contract. And so we actually started shooting on May 5th, the same day that Moody Musical had started shooting, six years later. Mm-hmm. Um, but casting it was very interesting. Very, very interesting because I was with an agency called the Gersh Agency and they were starting to get into like packaging things. Mm-hmm. So they said, would you consider using some of our clients? I said, I don't care, you know, who, who do you want me to use? <laughs> what do I care? Uh, I just they need to be names. I wanted, you know, names. So we originally were going to have Richard Benjamin mm-hmm. in the Leslie Nielsen role. Huh. Richard said he wanted to do it. We had lunch. I met him and his beautiful wife, Paula Prentice, and got along famously. And then got a call from Phil Gersh, who said, well, Richard would also, you know, he wants to be a director. Would you consider co-directing with him? I said, no. Absolutely, why would I do that? And so that was the end of Richard Benjamin. And then we went through, I oh God, I can't even imagine all the, the uh, Robert Stacks and the, you know, all the yeah. Lloyd, Lloyd Bridges, all the airplane people, you know, the, those kinds of serious actors. And uh, that's how Leslie came up, and, and happily he loved the script, and he signed on immediately. So once we had Leslie and Cindy, it was easy. <clears throat> but we went through hell casting Dr. Stark, <laughs> uh, because
because the original mm-hmm. person we wanted was, I think it was Lawrence Olivier. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, we were, were dreaming bigger. John Gielgud, one of those people. Yeah. You know, and they of course weren't mm-hmm. coming in. And uh, then we just started going to everybody. We went to Jose Ferrer, whose agent said, "Why would he do a film like this?" And Mark Haggard got <laughs> on the phone and said, "I don't know. Why did he do Dracula's Dog?" <laughs> And the agent hung up on us. And, uh, but the most serious contender was Christopher Lee. Yeah. Uh, we went to Christopher, who I thought would be wonderful, as Dr. Stark. And he read the script. He said, I loved it until I got eaten. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want it to be. He wanted to be in yeah. the entire movie, not only half. And then uh, Phil Gersh uh, read, said, well, you know, we represent Patrick McNee. Do you like him? I said, yes. Book him, and he loved him. He, so we booked him, and then the other, the Garrett Graham role was also really hard. The original actor, the, if you know anything about the history of the movie, was Christopher Lloyd. Oh, who loved it and wanted to do it, but he was, and he was a Gersh client. So he was on until three weeks before filming, and then the, Phil called and he said, you know, he's going through a divorce. He's miserable. He doesn't want to do anything, and can you let him out of it? And we did. And then Tim Thomerson was, we could, we read, and Larry Hankin we read, uh, and then Cindy Rett, uh, mentioned Garrett Graham, and I said, oh my God, I love him, beef, you go, let's have beef in our movie, you know, because he had played in Phantom of the Paradise brilliantly, mm-hmm. and I just thought he was brilliant that. A comic actor, so he came on board, and we had our cast, right? Mm-hmm. And then we got, you know, we did one sequence where we go see a movie at, at, on the spaceship, yeah. and it was Dirty Harry Strikes Back, circa <laughs> what we thought was the far off future of 2012, I think it was. Yeah, back, back then, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I was able to use Kenneth. Ken Toby, do you know who that is? Yeah, uh, the old character actor that Joe Dante used later. Yeah, the star of the thing. <laughs> yeah. We had him as the mayor, and we had uh, Paul Brinegar, who had play, you know, acted with Clint Eastwood in uh, Rawhide, and uh, as Clint, and uh, that was really fun. Did uh, Leslie Nielsen bring his fart cushion to the set? He brought his, <laughs> and it Williams' mother visited the set one day, <laughs> and he was relentless. <laughs> and she she went to Cindy and I. She said, "Does Leslie have a problem? <laughs> she says, has good vitamins I can recommend." <laughs> That's great. I love that. <laughs> and uh, Patrick with me would go, "Dear boy, what is with Leslie in this?" <laughs> And you, he would do it in scenes. It was unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scene with he, he and Garrett Graham walking down the hallway, you know, looking for the creature. Mm-hmm. And he just kept doing the fart machine. And if you watch the take in the movie, Garrett keeps looking around, like, where? what is that fart noise? Uh, but you don't, we took the noise out. But it was, we should have left it in now that I think about yeah. it. <laughs> what about the, the 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 title? Sometimes it's called spaceship. Sometimes it's called the creature wasn't nice. Well, the creature wasn't nice was the title mm-hmm. of the film, and then <clears throat> it didn't have a happy uh, uh, time of it in the editing. I was uh, I talked into hiring a editor that I should not have hired, who was a you know, nice, very nice guy, TV editor. Mm-hmm. whose father was a very famous editor. And uh, I didn't realize what a mistake that was until I saw his assemblage. <laughs> and then I knew we were in deep shit. And I didn't have enough distance. I did with Nudy Musical. Nudy Musical, you know, we fired the original editor and I cut it with this system. <clears throat> I had never been in an editing room, but I learned about filmmaking in that doing that movie, editing it. 
And but once I saw the assemblage, it was if you know what I mean, it was done. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't think outside of that structure or the script structure. Yeah. And I, I just, if I had had a young kid edit this picture, it would have hurt my friend Marshall Harvey. Uh, it would have been a whole different movie. But we did the best we could. We previewed it. And then we had two public previews of it. And and I knew they weren't happy with it. And none of us were. I wanted to go do more work on it, you know. And I, it got better and better as, we, as I did screenings. You know, I could see where it wasn't it was landing, and so I would go in and fix things and recut them. Had I had another month, I, I would have brought somebody else in, and we could have probably fixed it pretty well. So they mm-hmm. took it away from us and had a guy in New York, terrible guy in New York, recut it totally, put in the Japanese monster footage, changing the title to Spaceship, and they sent it to us and screened it, and I just went, oh, my God, <laughs> what is this horror thing I'm watching? Just, you know, but, you know, it was done, and they were going to release it, and so they ended up releasing it to one city somewhere in the south, and that was it. And, uh, but but then it hit cable, and, you know, isn't it a funny world? It hit yeah. that a guy on USA Cable, I can't remember, it was Captain Midnight or something. Captain, oh, Captain USA. Captain USA. And so kids discovered it. And it's like certain kids who discovered it on that show, because he show, was, showed it all the time. Mm-hmm. That's like their favorite movie. Yeah. And I'm going, but it's not very good. Yeah. <laughs> That's not very good. And, uh, you know, they changed the voice of the computer to that, I don't know what that is, that voice, that jive talking radio show guy would re- rewrote all that dialogue so it's totally unfunny you know it's my name on the film mm-hmm. so for years and years and years everybody thought that's what i made you know and you tell people no it's not what i made but you know they don't believe you so yeah <laughs> uh <clears throat> about two years ago i always had my cut on three quarter inch video mm-hmm. and so three years ago, I decided to, or two years ago, I decided to put it out. Finally, and it's the t- terrible quality and everything, and, but I figured we would put out the, the, the original version with it in the right ratio, you know, because all the home video releases are full frame. And you see over, the, everybody thought we were so terrible and inept because you see over the tops of sets and see yeah. at the bottom of the frame, you shouldn't see. And none of that's in the movie if you show it properly. In 185 so we um, <laughs> I was able to get my friend Marshall Harvey who's been editing for me for 40 years mm-hmm. um, to I had him watch it and I said tell me honestly what you would adjust you know make any cuts you want uh, if you have ideas for, for you know I, I felt I felt the music was lacking. I had never been happy with the, the score or parts of it because I wanted a theremin in it and um, didn't get one. And so we added a theremin <laughs> to the main title of music because uh, I happened to have a theremin. And uh, Marshall chose some music that helped everything wonderfully. It's amazing what music can do for pace. And he made a lot of trims. You know, like little, tiny little trims. And uh, we put it out, and it's a whole other movie. And it, it has stood the test of time because, you know, their whole thinking and what they did to it was that Airplane was the new way of doing comedy. Right. So gag, gag, gag. What they didn't learn from Airplane is it's, lit, it's got a structure. It's got a story. And they took the story out of our film. You know, they threw the scenes in the air and let them land where they may, trying to make it a joke comedy. And it wasn't designed to be a joke comedy in that way. So when you see it with a structure and linear, it makes a lot more sense. There's no Japanese monster footage. Right. And uh, so that was a real treat. And people who've seen it, 
the people who buy the DVD go, oh my God, this is a whole other movie, and it's much better. Yeah, <laughs> I got to see it on the DVD. I, I only remember the original version. Oh, I'm I, happy I, I, to send it. Oh, that'd be great! I, I see. I, I remember. I used to see the 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 uh, VHS for the movie on every video store shelf when I was growing up. I yeah, mean, they had it, and then they changed the title again. Uh, when it came to <clears throat> the original DVD release, they changed it to Naked Space because mm-hmm. they thought that was hipper than you know, because Naked Gun. Yeah. But nobody gave a shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not that. It's not a Zucker Brothers movie. So what, what made you want to write uh, your memoir There's Mel, There's Woody, and There's You? Well, I never wanted to do such a thing in my life. Mm-hmm. Ever. I mean, who would give a crap about my, you know, time? And I did a, a, a Q&A that I moderated. At, I would go back to LAC, Los Angeles City College. Because right. I'm the president of the Alumni Association for the Theater Department. So I would bring in, you know, famous people to do Q&As. And uh, one of the people I brought in was a casting director named Jeff Greenberg. One of the huge TV casting guy. And uh, he's in Nudie Musical. I gave him, got him his SAG card. And so he came in to talk to the kids. And I asked him, I said to him at one point, you know, I wouldn't like to be an actor today, Jeff. <laughs> he said, why? It's, it's, I said, no. It's, he, said, he said, it's the same as when we were going out. I said, really, Jeff? It's the same? I said, how would I get a guest shot today in the show business if I were unlucky enough to be an actor today? Yeah. I said, I'll tell you how I did it. I would go get a call from my agent. You would say, be at this Warner Brothers at noon. You would go at 1130, get the sides, look them over, read. Three hours later, somebody would have the job. You or one of the other four people. How would that go today, Jeff? (laughs) (laughs) He said, well, first you'd have to uh, read for me. I said, well, then I'm done because I hate you because you can't hire me. Why, do, why would I want to read for you? Because <laughs> uh, that's, you know, you never read for casting directors in the old days. They made appointments. <clears throat> they knew talent, and they made appointments. So I said, so I hate you, and I, I don't want to read for you. So he said, and he, I, he said, and I might give you an adjustment. I said, what are you, a chiropractor? What does that mean, adjustment? And he said, you know, <laughs> like a direction. I said, oh, direction. Like, And he said, and then I would put you on tape. I said, oh, you'd put me on tape. Okay. And you show that to the producers. And he said, yeah. And I said, and then I get the job if I'm the best. And he said, no. Then you have to go in and read for the producers. I said, but they just saw me on tape. He said, you have to go read for the producers. And they put you on tape. Yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, so now I've been on tape twice. Then I get the job if I'm the best? No, the tape goes to the network. I said, for a guest shot? He said, for, for five lines, for one line. I said, are you insane? So they put me on tape twice, and then I go to the network, and the network tells them who to cast? Yes. I said, well, I'm done. So I started thinking <clears throat> it would be fun. That was my way into the book that I could tell the story of how it was to be a young actor at a time when it was fun and easy. Um, you know what I mean? I was well, yeah. very lucky in my career. I worked all the time. and So that was the impetus for it. And then I just started writing it. And I just loved it. I wrote that book in two and a half weeks, 430 pages. Wow. <clears throat> but I couldn't stop because, you know, you're worried your memory will go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I have a really good memory about a lot of stuff. And I'm off a couple of times where I couldn't double check something. Mm-hmm. And subsequent to writing that book, I found all my day runners. If you know what that is, that's like little where you would write your appointments. Right. You know, they, like appointment books. And so I was able to see when I went on what this audition or this when, when I shot that show, I wasn't off much. And I certainly wasn't off by much, but it was really fun 
to revisit, and I'm very frank in the book, <clears throat> but I also wanted it to be a book about survival because I had a very rough time in the 80s and mm -hmm. I was kind of at the end of my rope and I wanted people to know you can come back from that. Oh, that's great that uh, you wanted to tell that story. You have to take your blinders off and see what else is around it. If something isn't making you happy, don't do it. Right. So what are you doing these days? So I became... <clears throat> Excuse me. Terrible 80s, ready to off myself. Mm -hmm. Had an epiphany, changed my attitude, because I, I got very negative, you know. I just kept saying, why hasn't it happened? You know, well, who gives a shit why it hasn't happened? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I had a great run of 14 years. I did everything you'd ever want to do, you know. Everything. Mm -hmm. Movie, you know, I directed two movies. I star in them. I <clears throat> did eight or nine pilots, leading roles. I did all those guest shots. But you hit the 80s, you go, why, 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 boo-hoo, you know. And it's boring for people to sit around that kind of negativity. And that's what I changed. And so I, I got into, I got involved because of a friend of mine in a show called Totally Hidden Video on Fox. And he and I were responsible for that show running, you know, as long as it did, because we were funny. And uh, I was there for three and a half, two and a half years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And financially, that changed everything because he made it was huge money every week. And um, then I and I had started a record label because I had helped start a record, a very popular film music label called Verez Saraband. Mm -hmm. back in the 70s and their very first sound I got them into soundtracks they were only releasing classical music I said they, and they asked me to invest in the company for $3,500 and I thought it was a loser and I wouldn't do it ha 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 and um, I got them into soundtracks I said do, do get yourself a niche and release it. there's no other company that does this regularly and their very first soundtrack was Nudie Musical nice very first soundtrack LP. So, and then they became this huge thing, you know, with Universal <laughs> distributing. Had I invested in that company, I would have been a millionaire in the 80s. So, I started my own label with two other people. And we did pretty well. Three years we were in existence and we released over 100 albums. But I was mostly interested in actually producing albums, you know, from scratch. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of reissues and new movies and stuff. Lots of classical also. And uh, we couldn't get paid. Our distributors were terrible and they were late pays. And, you know, we could never afford to do what we wanted to do. We were always behind because of these jerks. And so, but we started taking projects away from, we, we would get projects that Verez wanted. Mm-hmm. And so the guy who ran Verez, who I've known, you know, known since the late seventies, called me and he said, "Shut down the label and come here. Do it where you can do what you need to do." I said, "What?" He said, "Just I really would like you to shut down that label." I said, <laughs> "Of course you would." <clears throat> so he made me a deal that I could not refuse, and I shut down Bay Cities, which was that label we had, and. Came to Varese in '93, and uh, I was given my own division, Broadway division, where I could do Broadway and jazz and singers and cast albums. And within a year, <clears throat> I had been nominated for two Grammys and um, made Varese into the biggest show music label mm -hmm. outside of a major label ever. And in fact, the majors were out of it; they weren't doing much show, show stuff at all back then. Mm -hmm. And we brought it back. We brought show music back. And then everybody got back into it, of course. But we led the way, and I did 140 albums probably in seven years. Unheard of. I mean, from scratch. Nobody had ever done that in the history of music. I don't think anybody has still done it in yeah. the time frame in the history of music. <clears throat> Doing 19 albums a year. Wow. And... Um, and then he, you know, there were a couple of soft years, and he just decided, I, I, you know, it was expensive to do the albums I was doing. So as we went into the year 2000, I found myself out of work. 
<laughs> it's really irritating because he to get me to do it, he had told me I had a job for life. Mm-hmm. You know, the money was great. I was very happy. <clears throat> because the money was great, I didn't take royalties on anything I did. And then it was over, and that was devastating, but I didn't let it get me down. And I found some rich people in Louisiana who put up a million bucks to start another label and that happened immediately so uh, that was a horrible mistake as it turned out because they were not people one should be in business with and um, so I did that label from 2000 to 2001 and they ousted me from my own label because mm-hmm. not nice people and then I didn't want to do it anymore so I just kind of didn't I just kind of did nothing for three years. <laughs> you know, I mean, I put out new musical on Blu-ray or whatever, or maybe it was a DVD. No, this was in 2000. What was this? I can't remember. Even. 2001. Mm-hmm. Yes, I put it out on DVD and the, <clears throat> did the musical version. And we, I had Broadway producers attached to that for a while. And that didn't happen. But in 2015, I decided to start a new label, which I did called Kritzerland, and that we're still around. All these years, you know, it's been going uh, a long time now. Yeah. And uh, 16 years, and uh, I've done three or 400 albums. And people love us, and you know, but I got us into other areas. Uh, you know, I've released the Blu-rays and. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, the creature, and I went back to directing and uh, write. You know, I've written, and then in 2001, I wrote. I became a novelist of all things. <laughs> I wrote my first novel, and then that led to my second and third, which were part of a tri- that ended up being a trilogy. And then I started doing mysteries, and so it's 21 books, 21 years later. Ah, it's amazing. You've 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 survived and you've accomplished a lot. Do, do do you have anything upcoming? I have a lot of directorial stuff upcoming, mm-hmm. and I do a book a year. Uh, so I'll start a new book in January. Uh, January one, we start a new book always, and uh, it's the busiest time. I haven't been this busy in years. I, I and the irony is, I was busier during the pandemic than anything. Because I, you know, we do. I've been doing a monthly cabaret show mm-hmm. in LA since 2010. We just had our, our 11th anniversary of monthly shows, so I took them online uh, during the pandemic, and we became the poster child for how to do them online. We solved every technical problem and came up with a way to do them that then, then everybody started copying. <laughs> and I wrote an original musical for streaming and I wrote an original thriller for streaming. So last year was hugely busy and this year has been hugely busy. And next year's hugely busy. So I like it because I'm old now, you know, and <laughs> it's good to have, you know, something to do. <laughs> well, you are just amazing, Bruce. I want to thank oh, well, you yeah. so much for coming on today. I bored people to tears. Not at all. I mean, these are great stories. And again, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. That's my pleasure. And uh, I'll, I'll give you my address if you want to send me that Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, text me or IM me or whatever we do these days. I don't remember what it's called. PM. Yeah, <laughs> PM, DM. I, I don't even know the difference. <laughs> I just, you know, that, that whole world should go away. <laughs> Don't you think? Don't you think Mark Zuckerberg should just go? Booker should just go away. I think he should sell the company to somebody who could manage it better. Oh my God! And the metaverse? I don't want to know it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want a metaverse. It's bad enough. This verse, you know, whatever verse we're in right now, it's so <laughs> horrible. Facebook. Oh my God! What a cesspool. It is. It is. Well, you have yourself a great day, and please stay safe. All right, you too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Bruce Kimmel. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? And great stories. Very humble. He really is a survivor. I mean, he's been beaten down so many times, but he's gotten back up again. 
doesn't exude any bitterness whatsoever. I mean, he is a real man, I have to say. And go check out the, the first nudie musical. It's one of the funniest movies ever made. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.